basketball primarily and really exclusively today. I want to thank, first of all, 610 ESPN Philadelphia for giving me this opportunity. I want to thank God for introducing me to Mr. Malik Boyd and Malik Boyd Production. And I also have to thank my partner right here, Mr. Eric Woods. How you doing, Eric? Doing good, Dale. Doing good, man. Happy to be here. I cannot uh, take credit for this. This is Eric's brainchild. So tell the people real quickly what made you think that we could possibly pull this off, Eric. Dale, man, it's an honor to be here uh, and really part of the coming out party for you, my man. Um, history in the making for the city of Philadelphia. Sports talk in the city is missing, I believe, the flavor that you could bring, right? And I'm just blessed to be along for the ride. Um, and talking to Malik, about a year ago, uh, he approached me um, about bringing a sports talk show to Philly. And at the time, I didn't, I didn't know of anyone. Uh, but then as I got to, you know, think about it more and more and see more and more of the things that you do and the, the way you highlight the city of Philadelphia and the youth and everything that goes into that, I figured you were the perfect guy. And I want to make, you know, history with, with you giving a chance to be on the air and introduce yourself to Philadelphia sports, uh, uh, the Philadelphia sports community. Well, I, I thank you for that. And if you if you really don't want to see a lot of positivity, if you don't want to see uh, kids being highlighted, programs being highlighted, high schools being highlighted, scholarship offers being highlighted, this is not the show for you. We are going to be really positive. We're going to be positive all the time. We're going to leave the negativity somewhere else. We're happy. We're going to be starting up in a few minutes today. We're going to take the break right now, and when we come back, we're going to get into a lot of the action that took place last night. We have a lot. Last night was the first night of college basketball, and some of these kids really showed out. So we'll be back in a couple minutes. Every day, the men and women of the United States Marine Corps demonstrate their commitment to defend the American way of life. Since 1775, we have served our nation as a force in readiness. From combat operations to humanitarian assistance in every corner of the world. No matter where the mission takes us today or wherever our country needs us tomorrow, we always remember the land we call home. As Marines, we take a stand for each other for our nation, for us all, the few, the proud, the Marines. Sometimes I feel like a pharmacist. I'd say John and the kids are adjusting pretty well. They honestly have no idea what I'm going through. It can be a little challenging. Help. But so far, so good. I could really use just a little help. For those dealing with the daily struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community with experts and other caregivers for advice, tips, and support. Together, let's help each other better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. A little louder now. we back. Wilson and Woods. So we're going to kick things off by getting into some of the exciting developments that took place last night. As you know, last night was the first night of college basketball across the country. And we really going to focus in on some of the guys that – really excel. Now, personally, I attended the Temple Drexel game. It was Aaron McKee's first game as head coach, officially. You know, they had a couple exhibitions and scrimmages, and it was a good test. Uh, I think it was a perfect game to start his career off because, you know, Zach Spiker is very competitive, and his guys came to play, and they actually had the lead about midway through the second half. It was no pushover. 
they were they were they were undersized compared to Temple. They were not as athletic as Temple, but what they had was just uh, Spiker's personality. They just wouldn't quit. They just and if Temple gave them even the slightest opening, any kind of turnover, they went down the other end and they finished out pretty strong on every opportunity. But over time, just that size and athleticism just wore them down. And, and Aaron, even in the post-game conference, I think Aaron noted that he never felt comfortable during the game. He had some jitters himself. And he got all of that out of the way, and he got the win. So he'll take it. The city will take it. Temple will take it. Spike, we get with you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you go last night, or what game did you watch, Eric? Uh, I was checking out, uh, you know, of course, as a Hawk alum, uh, St. Joe's. I was very happy to see Billy Lang uh, open the Lang era, as as uh, we call it, with a W. Uh, really happy to see um, Mr. Daly put us on his back and take us to that W. So I was encouraged by the things I saw last night up on Hawk Hill. I think that bears a little bit of emphasis because you say you put him on the back. I've been teasing Ryan for about six months now. I told him I ex- I expected twenty five and five. Then I raised it up. I said, well, you know, twenty six and six. And then last night I think he came in with what twenty six, twenty six, six and four, or something like that. Ryan Daly will most likely be the most productive player that we have in the city of Philadelphia this year. I don't think there's any question because he's going to be called upon to do just about everything. I think he's going to have to lead St. Joseph's in points, three-point shots, rebounds, assists, everything probably but block shots. Well, as you say that, you were at uh, Temple last night. What did you think about Quentin Rose? Quentin Rose is a supremely gifted athlete. He did one play that I think may end up being the player of the year. I actually caught it on video, and I, I kind of shared it on my Facebook and on social media. He came down, and the Drexel Center was standing under the basket, and he kind of fancied himself as a rim protector. Hmm. And uh, Mr. Rose was able to really unlock that door, and he dunked so hard on that kid. I don't I don't know his name. I wouldn't even mention the name. <laughs> it was that bad. Um Quinn still he shows those flashes where you say, you know, this is this kid could be an NBA player. You know, but at times in college basketball, some of the things these guys try in the NBA, they really look out of place in college basketball. You know, the the sidestep, back up three, you know, the crossover, pull up three. He's got all of that stuff. I don't know if he has it where he's efficient enough and where I think Aaron would be comfortable enough with him taking those shots during collegiate games. But I think he's one of the pro prospects we have in the city. You know, know, Penn knocked off an SEC school last night. That's a big win. Penn beat everybody in the city last year. Yep. I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody really expected them to win that last year. Um, They kind of came from, it kind of came from not out of nowhere, but you know w- when you have schools t- traditionally like Nova for one, uh, Temple played hard last year. You n- nobody expected Penn to come out on top of the Big Five. Nobody. I can't say I'm surprised because if you know Donahue, whenever he's been in the Ivy League, he's been able to really put together Ivy League teams that are dominant. You know his team that he had at Cornell. For about a two-year period, I think they made it to a Sweet 16, actually. One year, he had a big guy. Uh, he's got P.J. Brodeur, who arguably is the best player in the city. He's got Ryan Bentley coming back off a season-ending injury last year. He picked up Dana Dingle's kid, who had like 24 points in his first college game. He's got Goodman from Germantown Academy. And I don't think the big Asian kid, his name is uh, Wang Chang. Wang, he's a good player. He's a good player. And I, he didn't play yesterday. And without that kid, they beat Alabama. So I look for Penn, maybe, maybe. I don't, you know, I love Aaron and all of them, but Penn's got to be. You talking right repeat now. Big Five champs? Hey, why not? And then we had an interesting matchup for Villanova. Tommy Funk got to go against Colin Gillespie. For those of you who don't know, Tommy Funk 
because he plays at Army, we people really don't pay a lot of attention. But he is having one of the all-time great Philly point guard careers right now. He had 1,000 points and 500 assists going into his senior year this year. And um, I don't know if the NBA or anything like that is in his future. But right now, as it stands, he and Josh Sharkey are just having phenomenal collegiate careers. And I think they they are definitely worth mentioning. Definitely. Now, what about some of the guys who play out of town? Before we get into that, let's let's bring in. We got a couple people here that also attended some games last night. And um, I think it's really fitting that I have these guys here today. Uh, the first guy. Really, along with Eric, I can say is really responsible for this show even existing. It was about five or six years ago. Um, I had just watched uh, maybe a week or two before that. I had just watched team final play Philly Pride out at Chichester. And when I got to the front desk to go in, I thought it would be like $5 or something to watch the game, you know, in Chichester. Guy asked me for $15. <laughs> and $15. So I looked at the promoter's name, and I, I don't want to give him a free commercial, but I went up to Kamal. I said, who is this guy? Why, why is he able to charge $15? I said, Kamal, I don't understand this grassroots stuff. I just know that I just watched the Sunny Hill All-Star game, and I had to pay $15 for it. And, you know, 10 years ago, you walk in McGonagall, you see all these same level of kids mm -hmm. for free. So Kamal and I immediately started a dialogue after that. And one day we were sitting in um, Starbucks. And we were talking about his vision and my vision. And I told him, I said, you know, I just think there's room for another voice in this Philadelphia media landscape. You know, I said, I think some of our opinions get overlooked. Some of our kids get overlooked. And he said, you know, you could do it. And with that, we started this, this Black Cager thing. And I told him. I said, you know, we would always go back and forth. I said, you know, at some point, man, you got to get one of these championships, you know. We got a team out of Delaware that got a few. And uh, Jimmy Sammons picked up one up at the players when he had Isaiah Briscoe in him. He won Peace Jam. And I said, come on, you're right there every year. You got to get one of these championships. So here we are, you know, four or five years later, we're on ESPN Radio, and he's got a national champion under Armour Association, 16 and under squad, and he's got a plethora of kids playing college basketball. So it is my pleasure to have him here because it's only right that he comes in on this inaugural show today. How you doing, Kamal Yard? I'm doing great, Dell. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm really happy with the progress of, uh, of yourself and um, our vision, and I'm um, lo looking forward to it, man. And... Sitting to his right is a young fella, but he 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 actually my old head. He don't like to admit it. He's older than me. I met him in September 1983. I get to college, and this little guy running around in muscle shirts all the time, talking about he's a football <laughs> player, right? So he always doing push-ups, lifting weights. And, and I'm like, well, you know, he, so I'll get to know him, and he's telling me he's from Ridley, and, you know, I'm from Darby Township. You know, Ridley, I don't know about Ridley. Oh, we got two Ridley guys in the house, man. I'm surrounded. So we get to know each other, and we build a friendship that has lasted this long. That's September 1983. And I guess he came to his senses. What was it? Was it the concussions and all that that made you switch over to basketball? You left that football stuff alone. Howard Hudson. No, I really did. First, I'd like to thank thank you, Dell, for all the good work that you do, not only in the um, – not only in the basketball scene, but in the community and the work that you do with kids. Uh, I just had to say that first because I know you're not recognized or get the, the just do that Absolutely. you well deserve. Absolutely. Um, as far as the basketball, it started by accident. And I actually did coach basketball and football for over 25 <laughs> years. So I've been a, each group that I actually had started out with football and Rondé Hollis Jefferson. I coached him in in football, and then basketball season. So I never stopped coaching uh, football. So it wasn't the concussions? No. <laughs> Actually, uh, I got involved with uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Wilson. He was the mayor of Chester, and he really got me involved. He was the head of AAU, and right now I'm sitting in his position. 
we lived in the same dorm on the same floor, and I never saw him with a basketball. Now he's one of the best grassroots basketball guys in America and the president of Middle States AAU? Middle Atlantic AAU. Middle Atlantic AAU. And that runs from where? Northern Maryland up to New Jersey? All of Delaware, Pennsylvania up to Harrisburg, and New Jersey up to Trenton. So you've been involved, both of you guys have been involved with AAU for 20 years now, That's plus. Yeah, yeah. So before we get into that, we'll save that for the next segment. What I want to know is where were you both at last night? Start with you, Howard. Where you go last night? Of course, I had to go down to Maryland to see my uh, two of my kids that played for me, Dante Scott and Hakeem Hart, uh, each performed well. Uh, Dante ended up for with the, nine for points. The, hold up. For the people that don't know, for the people that don't know, who is Dante Scott and who is Hakeem Hart? Where they go to high school, where they from? You know, I think it's worth noting that these kids had incredible high school careers. I'll even take it a step further. I'll say that Dr. Scott had an all-time high school career. And, you know, we get caught up in nostalgia. You know, people like to think back that it was just so much better when I was in high school. When I was playing, it was different. He couldn't do that now. Dante Scott would have won games in 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980. Did he ever lose a home game in high school? No. (laughs) Did he ever lose a public league regular season game ever? No. No. Four years of high school. Four years of high school. He did lose one playoff game. Correct. Booty got him, right? Booty and uh, Bonner. Bonner. That wasn't a pub, though. Bonner is the Catholic League. league. Correct. So Booty is the only public league guy when these guys are our age. He can run in the Dante on the street and be like, yo. I got you. I got you. <laughs> All right, so that's Dante. And Hakeem Hart started off over in New Jersey, right? Yes. And he did his first few years of high school in New Jersey. Then he transferred to Roman. Correct. And there was a lot of scuttlebutt. People thought maybe his uh, – because he was scoring in, like, uh, bunches over in New Jersey. People thought he's not going to be able to do that when he comes over to the Catholic League. He's done and it I his know, whole life. He's going to do it wherever he was at. My colleague here is actually on that staff. Uh, were you there for both his years? Uh, no, just just, uh, just last year. His senior year. Just the senior year, yeah. So he's now at Maryland as well. So how they do last night? Both of them did very well. Uh, uh, they're both growing with the program. Dante started off. Um, can't, he was a uh, first man off the bench, ended up with 9.6 rebounds and one assist. I came came off the bench, knocked down. He had one three, but they both look pretty good in in their role at, uh, at Maryland. Where is Maryland ranked right now? Number seven in the country. So these guys come from Philadelphia. They go down to Maryland. Maryland's no longer for those who don't really follow it closely. People might think they still play Duke in North Carolina. <laughs> it's been a while. Right. They're out of that league. They're in the Big Ten. Yeah. Play Indiana, Penn State, Wisconsin, but they're in the Big Ten. These kids and they're. They're on the seventh ranked team, and Dante is is firmly in the rotation. Was he like six, seventh man? Six man. And Hawk is probably the second or third guard off the bench right now, Correct. fighting. But he'll get in most games and he'll play. Um, where'd you go last night? Come on. So I went to uh, Townsend State uh, University and George Washington University. Where was that game held at? So that was in Maryland, in Townsend, Maryland, and that was uh, featuring uh, two, two former Philly Pride players. And Allen, A.B. Beatran, and Jameer Nelson Jr. Uh, Jameer Nelson Jr. is a starting point guard for George Washington, freshman point guard. Uh, Allen Beatran is uh, a sophomore for Townsend State, and uh, they both played extremely well. Allen Beatran finished with 20 points. Jameer Nelson finished with 15 points, seven rebounds, five assists in his first college game. So uh, That's was, better than his daddy did. I was there at his yeah, daddy's yeah, first game. Yeah. Now, did you play with his father? So was, so was I. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute, but you got again. You got the little Roman connect with B Tran, right? And you actually wore the hawk uniform. Wore the hawk uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Did you play with them? How, you missed that, didn't you? Ninety-seven to Two. one. So you was on the. So Jameer was a one. freshman. Jameer was a freshman when I was a senior. He was my. Okay. He was my. Uh, he was my young buck. Um, and then. But he had the ball though. He he yeah look he had the ball. First day he walked on campus. So, no, he had the ball at prom. Phil drove Phil, to look, Phil, prom. Look, Phil gave him gave the ball him. on his way up 95. Yeah. He gave him the ball. <laughs> Phil gave him the ball, and, you know, Phil never looked back. And Jameer led us 
that year to um, a second round showing in the NCAA tournament. And his son has the ball right now. The ball. Uh, in the same league. It would have been at St. Joe's if they didn't yeah. decide to go in another direction. That's that was a tough one to get away. Uh, because you you know, that's a that's a huge legacy on Hawk Hill. And for that um to happen and him to go down to GW in league, uh hopefully don't come back to bite us too many times here in the next couple in the next couple years. But the talent he has, I'm I'm sure he's gonna give us trouble. Well, let's go down the list, man. Let's let's mention a couple other guys. Samir Dowdy's He's one of your guys, man. You dealt with him in high school in yeah, the grassroots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd he do last night? I think Samir had 20 points. 20 points. You know, he's been a really good college player all the way through. He was a real contributor at VCU. Transferred. He's been a starter and a contributor since he's been playing at Auburn. But I think this year I actually talked to the Auburn coaches. They need him to step yeah, up yeah, and, yeah. and get buckets. Yeah. So it's on him. Uh, what's your thoughts? You think he's capable of really getting that done in the SEC? Yeah, I think he's more than capable. I think that, you know, uh, because of the depth that they had last year, um, he had to be a star in a limited role, if that makes sense to you. So he was kind of like a, a key card guy off the bench that can kind of spark them. If you notice, he had his biggest games, um, you know, with the biggest audience, in particular the Final Four, uh, the championship game where he was pretty big. Um, and he lost those games, but um, he, he's ready for that. He's, he's, he's ready for that, that stardom. It comes with being a guy at Auburn in the SEC. We had some some performances for these guys opening up last night that are really just breathtaking. I think one that really jumps out to me, in addition to Ryan Daly, Ryan, I would put Ryan one, but Tyre Marshall scored 20 points, went nine for nine from the field. He did not miss a shot. He had seven rebounds. Ryder won the game. Yeah. Talk about Tyre a little bit. You too, Howard, because you, you saw him and how he was overweight. Where did he start off? He didn't so start he off sta- at King. No, he started off at Roxborough. Okay. So uh, he started off at Roxborough. Um, at the time, uh, uh, Coulson, Sean Colson, who's a childhood friend of mine, over 35 years, uh, had just got the job at Martin Luther King. And um, so myself and Amaro seen Ty Hare. Uh Martin Luther King would have been more of Ty Hare's, um, uh s- neighborhood school because he's, he's from the Germantown area. So he wound up going to King with Colson, and the Colson worked his magic. With Tyre, Tyre was got overweight. his body right. Got his body right. He was wearing these goggles. They had no straps to him. You know what I mean? And uh, Colson kind of got him together. Played with Philly Pride. We got him together. Colson coached him, and uh, he went to Ryder. And now he's, uh, you know, a senior writer doing phenomenal things, and uh, and with a, with a great trajectory for his life. Tyre Marshall will make a lot of money playing basketball. I agree. I don't know where, but he'll make some really good money. Now, how the kid that you and I talked about extensively last year because oftentimes some of these kids tend to fall through the cracks and and it just takes a while for them to latch on, to find a scholarship, to get it done. And this came through kind of like the last minute, and we both really couldn't understand it. Talk about Jameer Reed a little bit because he got his scholarship late, and he may have one of the better freshman seasons judging off what I'm seeing so far. Jameer Reed is a a physical specimen. He's – a six four guard, six four two hundred pound guard that can shoot the lights out. Where would he go to high school? Um, Mastery Mastery North. Math, Mastery North, and that's a good program. Good program. Nip is the coach. Yep. What's Nip's last name? Uh, Nip Cook. Nip Cook. Coach Nip. Yeah. They've um, they they did they win or did they play for the state championship? They they played for the state championship. They always in the mix. They always in the mix. They always in the mix. Yeah. One of the better pub programs. Yeah, correct. And uh, so why 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 would a kid that could shoot it? He's got the body. He's athletic enough. He plays smart. He had the grades. What was it that made him take, made it take so long for this kid to find a school that would pay his bills? One of the things, uh, uh, Jameer, he started on the uh, AAU scene late. I mean, he only he only did it his uh, senior year. Okay. Uh, so he he didn't start out like most players, you know, in ninth grade, you know, playing on uh, one of the uh, sneaker circuits. He started, you know. His last year, going into his senior year, so that's why I think he was—he didn't get the, re, you know, the looks that he should have. Well, e, you're a Division One player. What do you think about the point that Howard just made? He's saying that not playing on the AAU circuits early really almost cost this kid a chance to go to sco- go to college for free. 
When you from St. Louis, right? Yeah, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, is high school basketball bigger than AAU as far as college recruiting in St. Louis? Is it the same as Philly? Could you compare and contrast? So I, I think the landscape today is pretty much the same across the country. Um, what we see is, you know, kids have to play a major role in the summer basketball circuit to be seen. The same was true for me 20, 22 years ago. Uh, I played in high school, um, but I, it, it wasn't until I became part of a prestigious program, St. Louis Eagles, which is now Bradley Billy Elite, that I got my look because my – Didn't come through high school. Didn't come through high school at all. Um, now, once I started playing, coaches came to see me play once they had saw me on the East Coast and down in Florida, Vegas, and things like that. Um, but I didn't get the attention I, I, I got close to when I was on the, the AAU circuit back then. My team, Larry Hughes, Justin Tatum, Jason Tatum's father, mm -hmm. um, and about five other Division One kids. We all went D1. Um, all from AAU. All from AAU. Strictly playing travel basketball back then. It has changed a little bit now, but back then it still was the way. So, come on, is, is AAU – for the college coaches in high school, it's for the fans and the family. Like, what, what, what are we doing here? You said for the college coaches. What's more important for the college coaches? The, the I graduates? think the AAU. I think the AAU is more important. And the high school stuff is for the school spirit, the alums, yeah, your mom, spirit. your I, grandma. I, I, yeah, I think that, um, you know, with respect to the, the college coaches, uh, for the most part, they want to see the kids against the better players. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they can get a better gouge of what are they getting. They get a better gouge of what are they recruiting when they can see a kid against another kid that's of likely talent. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes with the high school, uh, you may have in a good league, like the Catholic League, but there are also games where you're going to be playing where One or two not. Division One players absolutely. on the court. Absolutely. Yeah. Where absolutely. if you go to an Under Armour Association game, You got eight, ten Division nine, One players ten. and ten Division One players yes. yeah. on each team, and yeah. they all rumbling. So, so to that point, my high school in St. Louis, we only played one team that had – College level kids, and th that was when we played Larry Hughes' team. Mm -hmm. Take that to when I go on the road now. I'm playing against Riverside. They got Elton Brand, Eric Barkley, Anthony Glover, Ron Artest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, now coaches can't just come and sit and right. see all of that. Ten high level kids on one court, right, right, at the same time. Right, right. Well, it leads to a lot of situations where. I think the NCAA becomes very reactive and a little overreactive, and they try to, you know, take a lot of that influence away from summer basketball. And one of the recent developments we saw was the, the blending. So they're trying to take the high school action and put it in the summertime right. and have some kind of blended model. And we saw that they had one of the better tournaments in the country, John Mosco, Andre Noble from Wood, MOTEP, respectively, they put together, had to be one of the top two or three high school live period events. I went, I think, at least to two sessions each of the two weeks that they had it. There was never less than 180, 200 Division One coaches in there. Do you think that's the, the wave of the future now? It seems that the NCAA doesn't like all the emphasis that you guys had. I think that that, you know, I, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I think that um, out of those events that happened in June, there were massive, not a few, there were massive amounts of kids who got scholarship offers who, and who put themselves on the college radar. And for me, that's always a win. This is really what it's all about. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm pro having um, those events in June. I think we need them. Um, I think that they should continue it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's about the kids, and the kids are getting massive amounts of attention as a result. Howard, as, as president of the AAU for Middle States, I know you go to these meetings and you guys have to plan and work around it. You know, this is a real big shift in the landscape. Like, what's the perspective from AAU? Is it a plus? Is it a negative? Is it something you guys have to work around and incorporate? As far as the kids benefit, I think it's a plus because the kid, the kid that doesn't that doesn't um, have the opportunity to play on one of the sneaker circuits still gets a look at college coaches now. Um, I think, and uh, 
as a uh, AAU coach and a AAU leader, I think that um, it it kind of hurts AAU because you know it takes out another um, another area where they usually uh, you know the kids are usually getting attention and they're not anymore. So I mean, in a different way, you know, it's taken away from AAU, but it's actually benefiting the kids okay. that wouldn't be seen. Well, look, when we come back, we're gonna talk a little bit about difference between grassroots and AAU and all of that stuff. So we're going to go to a break now and we see you on the other side. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your basement. There's a pair of overalls that overall you're not so into anymore. A perfectly good laptop that hasn't seen your lap in months. And even more stuff, but still no jobs? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? That can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed. And they're the stuff inside your stuff. Even inside that winter coat that moved with you to Phoenix. Our job is to unlock those jobs. And it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover guitar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. Find your nearest donation center at Goodwill.org. A message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. In May of 2000, Dave O'Karnakar skied the full descent of Mount Everest. Every day somewhere in the world, someone base jumps off a bridge, an antenna, a building, or a mountain peak. At Mavericks, surfers brave 60-foot faces and a punishing rock bottom to ride the world's largest waves. Across suburbia, skateboarders transform curves, stairs, swimming pools, and cement flood basins into Everests of their own making. In the old days, we called these people adventurers. Now, we call them extreme sports enthusiasts. There's a group of people who jump out of helicopters into 30-foot ocean swells, race vehicles through war zones, chase hurricanes, fly through walls of fire, and maneuver zodiacs through flash floods, all in an effort to save lives. We call these people the Air Force Reserve. The Air Force Reserve. Live the extreme. At any given moment, somewhere in America, a baby is taking a first step, a developmental milestone. But for too many parents, a baby's first steps aren't just a milestone, they're a miracle. These are the parents of babies who were born prematurely or with birth defects. It's a crisis affecting more than half a million babies in the United States each year. You can help them by joining volunteers like you who walk in March for Babies. The money you raise funds research and local programs that help babies overcome the challenges of premature birth and birth defects. Together, our steps make stronger, healthier babies a reality for thousands of families. Sign up today at marchforbabies.org to take the steps that help make milestones and even miracles possible. Who will you march for? It's Thursday night, and you're grabbing drinks with some friends. Started off with a pitcher for the table, which quickly becomes two. There's pool. And there's the photo booth. All right, everybody squeeze in. Say cheese. Followed naturally by an order of wings. And another. Can we get some extra ranch sauce? Then there's the ceremonial nightcap. So what are we doing this weekend? And lastly, it's back to the car, which, if you're buzzed... ...could be the most expensive night of your life. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Welcome back. Now, this is the part where my partner, Eric, just reminded me where we have to deliver on our promise to provide raw, authentic, and intelligent sports discussion. So I want to pose this question to all three of you right now, and I think that each of you can provide some real insight to the people listening in. 
what is the actual difference between grassroots basketball and AAU basketball? I think we use these terms interchangeably in the public, and I think, you know, moms, grandmoms, and all the people that end up paying a lot of times for the the fees for the kids to play, they have no idea what the difference is. So if we can go over that real quickly, since we have the president of Middle States AAU, why don't you define and discern for the people what the difference is between actual AAU basketball and regular grassroots basketball, Howard? Uh, AAU basketball is more com- is a, on a more competitive level. Um, you have uh, Division One, Division Two kids high level with high level skill sets. Grassroots basketball consists of anybody can actually play grassroots basketball. You know, it's, it consists of the lower level team uh, kids, but it gives an opportunity for all kids to participate. So, and AAU stands for Amateur Athletic Union, but it's. The term is misused because a lot because AAU is different from the sneaker sneaker company, correct? And that's the super elite stuff, the sneaker company stuff. AAU used to be super elite, right? Before Nike, Under Armour, and before they came in with the league and leagues, it was a way to kind of defer. It was a way to kind of separate. All right, this is you know obviously super elite, and then this is just um, you know. Uh, it's competitive, super competitive. Right? So, 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 so ahead, like ahead. back when I was playing AAU, which was when sneakers companies were, were just getting into it, because we, St. Louis Eagles had a Nike deal, but we were still playing only AAU tournaments, AAU sanctioned events, um, and then probably by pro- probably by the time I graduated college, it was turning toward EYBL and things like that. Right. Um, and then when you talk about grassroots, I tend to think about grassroots as like a Philly pride having lower level squads where they're really raising kids on what it means to become elite, right? right. And, you know, that's kind of my vision when I think about grassroots and what I hope most organizations at your level reach down and do. To build the program up, right. So to me, grassroots always simplify exemplify development, right. All right. It's always to me it always exemplify development, and then as you progress in grassroots, then you eventually morph into to what I would say AAU, which is more of the elite uh, uh, level scholarship chasing, scholarship producing mm-hmm. kids, right. Um, but I kind of uh, all the time it, I think it's it's, it's all melted into, melted in together, um, so, but I think that um, you know AAU is more elite level scholarship producing, scholarship chasing kids. Grassroots is more the development. Yep. Um, but you got a lot of people that don't know, so they just everything is just thrown in the same pot. People don't have a clue, and then within the individual organizations, everybody does it differently. Everybody does exactly. it differently. Now I know Howard a while, and I watched him what he would do is grab kids maybe 6th, 7th grade, and then he would just stay and with those kids 6th right. grade, then you would coach them in 7th grade, then you would coach them in 8th grade, then in ninth grade. Other organizations, you have a 6th grade coach, then he'll pass them off to the 7th grade coach, or pass them off to the 8th grade coach. So it's all kinds of different ways of doing it, and I think parents need to really do some research and understand. And since we have you here, I think we need to talk about some of the results that you guys have been able to get. Let's just go currently playing college basketball. Some of the guys that I can name off the top of my head that came through your program. We got Chris Arch at Villanova. Yep. You got Dante Scott, Hakeem Hart at Maryland. We got Ray Somerville out of Cal Bakersfield. Jamil Riggins. Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac. Keep going. B Tran at Towson. At Townsend, we have uh, Jameer Reed. Jameer Reed at Central, Central Connecticut. Connecticut. State. I think we have. I mean, it's, yo, you hit me with on, on the spot. We got so many kids. I be forgetting all the time. Yeah. Alan, and, Powell. Alan, Alan Powell. Alan Powell. His father the will Ryan not kids. like me no, overlooking <laughs> Alan yo, Powell. And, yo, you know what? Let me say, then, hold on. Let me say it again. Alan Powell <laughs> is a freshman <laughs> at Ryder. I love Alan Powell. Good guy. Great family. And again, Alan never even played seventeen and unders for you guys. He didn't. So they that was can't. really, you know, with Alan, that was really um, 
it was it was, a, it was it was something that we crafted, and I think that's one of the things that differentiates us from a lot of other programs. You got other programs that are doing some great things, um, but we always have vision and foresight. Um, so before we we take any kid in our program, we assess what, what our work is going to have to be with that kid to get him a scholarship. To get him a scholarship is everything is based around that. So with Alan Powell, he was really young. He was 16 years old, but he was going into his senior year. So we figured out, okay, well, he's 16, so what we should do? So we played him on the 16 and under because the plan was, hey, we're going to play him on the 16 and under. We're going to send him to a post-grad school. He originally was going to go kind of reclassify mm-hmm. because he was so young. And then what happened was he decided to um, stay at LaSalle. He played. Had a phenomenal senior year. Absolutely tore and it up. And then got scholarship offers, and then his mom and dad said, hey, that's what we're going to do, and it's free tuition, and they took the scholarship offer to write. And, and he was prepared academically. I know yeah, that's, yes, that's something that, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to go on a few of the college visits with Howard, yep. and th- that was, like, the main question. I actually watched. We can talk about Dr. Scott Howard. I watched him go from being a little unsure of himself during these visits, to about the third one, we didn't even really have to ask questions. I mean, Dante kind of took over. He said, you know what? I have these, you know, these are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. This is where I need help. Yeah. You know, explain to me how you're going to make sure that I can graduate and earn my – I was blown away when he got to that point. Talk about that a little bit, How Actually, a tear came to my eye because, <laughs> you know, like Dell said, you watched the kid develop right in front of your eyes from, mm-hmm. visit, from visit to visit. Yep. And if you know Dante Scott, one thing I want to say about Philly Pride, when we take kids in, they're not the top names in the community. You know, they, nobody. Well, knows, nobody. hold up, hold up. The guys y'all got right now got a whole bunch of 3.9, 4.0, 12, 1,300 SAT That's, stuff going on. Yeah, but nobody knew that. Nobody they, knew nobody that. Nobody knew that. They, they developed. Some of them had, had those, those core Academic strengths, but nobody knew. Some, so you, that has to be nurtured. So, so you go to friend select and you pick up a player and you don't think he's a superstar student. Well, not friend select. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, friend central. Look on the list. I mean, if you have a list of kids that are the best in the area. When we when we originally take them in, they're not on the, some. A lot of them aren't on the list, and the ones that are on the list are low on the list. They're not the top names when we take them. So, yeah. you know, it's a, a lot of hard work. That goes in a lot of hard. You know, practice. Well, I know that. I know that. So let's let's back up a, just uh, just a bit to talk about the academic points that you guys kind of stress in Philly Pride. Because as a parent who may be listening um, and interested in their kid, you know, maybe re- uh, reaching out to Philly Pride basketball. What is your message when it comes to academic preparation? Because you all are putting kids in college, so there has to be some type of messaging some type of expectations that you all put in place because you don't want to take a kid who who cannot, you know, excel academically at these universities. Early identification. Early identification in terms of um, and, 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 and honest identification of where your kid stands academically. That's, that's To me, that's the number one part. So first, when you get past that, then we can kind of come up with contingency plans. Okay, this is where the kid is. This is what we need to do. This is the service that we need to apply. Early identification. I think that um, it's it's really pretty safe to say that all of the guys at the top of these shoe company affiliated teams are very, very concerned about the academics. One, because they genuinely care. And two, because it's just a horrible look to have a kid travel (laughs) around with you for two summers, right. and, you know, you done took them to 15 different cities, you done paid for all this stuff, and the kid can't qualify and go to school. So what I've known over, and I, I mean, I can go back 10 years with most of these guys at least, I've probably seen 80 90% of the transcripts from the kids from Philly Pride. And in tomorrow, Austin is yes. one of the few guys in the city that can really – read a transcript, and give a family a, a, an accurate yeah, read yep. on where they need to go. Yep. A lot of people don't know how to do it, and a lot of guys that don't know how to do it, they'll find somebody. Mm-hmm. And, and I think Terrell Myers falls into that camp. Yep. Rob Brown falls into that camp. They'll say, hey, man, can you take a look at this for me because I have these concerns? I just want to make sure 
that we're taking the right courses and so on. And as a result, if you really look at what these guys have been able to do with these kids, you might have one or two kids here and there every year that doesn't make it. But for the most part, over 90% of these kids are going off to college on scholarship. And if you compare that to the non-student athlete population, the difference is staggering. I mean, we're talking about predominantly black males. We have, you guys have, they'll have a Chris Archie Diakono, they'll have a John Harar a once in a while. But for the most part, you know, probably <laughs> right. 85, 90%. The percent of the guys, average, yeah. If you look at the African-American male graduation rate in Philadelphia, you're talking about in four years, between 25, 35 A lot, lot, lot of at risk guys, man. Right. Yes. Yeah. So they're to be commended for that. I'm glad you brought that up because people don't give the guys working with these kids enough credit for that aspect of what they do. It's they get it task. done. It's a major task. They major get task. it done. All right. So what is Philly Pride? Where did it come from? How y'all guys get involved in this stuff, and, and what's the mission? Like, what are you trying to do? I know you won the championship, so you trying to repeat next year. Yeah. What, what's, what's going on? With Yo, you? so so we trying to so so where we where we come from, where we started at. So Philly Pride started. It, it originally started as Catino Mobley, um, Catino Mobley AAU program. Um, Catino Mobley is my first cousin. He got drafted ninety eight, ninety nine, um, and I had some little guy with braids named Kyle Lowry, who needed an AAU program after he got and got cut or released from a couple of programs that he was playing for. So I took him to a game at LaSalle. We went to Explorer's Den. It was a cheesesteak place. And he was in there. We had pizza and cheese. And he was like, yeah, I don't got no AAU team, right? And I was finishing up college. I'm like, I got no AAU team. But, you know, I did know that my cousin Catino needed to do some community stuff. So I said, hey, you know what? You're from the neighborhood. And I said, all right, I'm going to get behind in the bush. So, you know, we created Catino Mobley AAU program. Got Kyle, the rest is history. In 2010, we morphed into Philly Pride. In 2006, we morphed into Philly Pride. 2010, Under Armour. And the rest has been history. Um, and our mission has always been the same. It's really to help kids transition, you know what I mean, and families transition in life with respect to um, educationally, with respect to obtaining college scholarships. Um, we know what that does for families as a whole. Um, we've seen it up front what it does for families as a whole, and, and that's our mission. And we look at it as um, uh, me and my man Amaro always laugh about this, and people laugh about the community stewards. That's exactly who we are. We, we Our job is to move the community and move the kids and families forward. That's what it is. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've known Howard since 1983, but I've actually known his wife since second grade. <laughs> um, we grew up together. We went to school together, and I, I know her well, and – what about AAU gives you the urge over these years to leave home, leave your kid, and travel with six, seven, eight, ten kids in vans up and down the country, flying through all these airports? Why do this with these kids? Well, like you said earlier, I started a little different because I start with the kids when they're, you know, 10 years old. Dante Scott, for instance. So, you know, you get the opportunity to take a kid, you know, that doesn't have any um, desire in the, you know, in the academic field. Um, he's not doing good in school. Basically, we take at-risk at kids and Absolutely. turn their lives around. Absolutely. And Absolutely. That's, and that's what we specialize in. Um, Dante, for instance, he was in special ed classes when, we, when I first got him at, at 10 years old. Um, and he found out real quick I wouldn't let any of my kids play basketball if they didn't do well in school. So, what, you know, from that point on, the kid went from special ed classes to mainstream classes to Maryland uh, University of Maryland today. So Now, this is, this is a little-known fact. I think it, it's worth noting. Um, when Dante Scott when Dante Scott was trying to figure out where he wanted to go in Absolutely. high school, that um, and this wasn't the first time that I've seen Philly Pride do this, you guys actually had his IEP. Yep. In your hand. Yeah, right. And we went over it. We looked at it. And we went around and we talked to the different schools. And we said, well, hey, this is the issue. Look at this test. Look at how these are the accommodations. What can be done? Because in four years, this kid needs to go to college. And we think basketball is the, really the primary way he's going to be able to do it. I don't know if mom 
I don't know a lot of moms that can cut that forty, fifty thousand dollar check. <laughs> right, right. Some cases right. seventy. You know, right, Jameer right. Nelson scholarship is probably eighty. Yeah. George yeah. Washington is expensive. Yeah, George Washington's high. And and so, you know, I, I think that people really don't understand how much goes into that. And so you guys settled really on MOTEP and a lot of people might think it was about the basketball. And of course you were looking for a strong basketball program, but it was the special ed program at MOTEP. They put it over the top. Correct. Well, we really, really thank you guys for coming in here. Uh, Eric and I will be back every week at the same time. And Eric, I think we have a tremendous season to look forward to. This week, we didn't do anything on high school basketball. And I don't care what anybody says. You know, I'm 54 now. And guys my age, and guys a little, especially the guys a little older, the guys from the 70s. The basketball was invented with, with Lou, <laughs> right, right. Lou Lloyd, Gene Banks, and Ricky Mo Tuck Howard, and, Ricky Tuck, yeah. and it ain't been a good player since. Yeah, right, 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 right. I would argue that we are currently in the golden era of basketball in Philadelphia. And when you look at what these kids are doing across the country right now, take this kid, Makai. Uh, this uh, Abilene Christian, what's his name? Makai Morris. Makai Morris is playing for Abilene Christian. They're coming to town. They're playing Drexel on the tenth. I think that's Sunday. Publicly, kid. Publicly, in Germantown kid. area. Yep, yep. Will McNair is playing basketball for New Mexico State right now. And Will Will was an at risk kid in every way, academically, socially. He was immature. He wasn't ready. He got in touch, you know, guys like Rodney Vini, yep. guys like Dwayne Jones, Sean Colson, yep. Chris Glar, yep. Sean Colson, just grabbed this kid and kept, you know, man, you got some ability, you got some talent, we're going to leverage this. And to his credit, Will hung in there, and now he has a scholarship, and he's playing this year. And I didn't mention at all today, up till now, the kid I think may be the best player we have from Philly playing college basketball this week. Zane Martin is going to turn it out at the University of New Mexico. Agreed. This year. Agreed. So going forward, we're going to pay a little bit of attention to these high school guys because they're some really good action and we'll, they will be the future and we can catch them down the road uh, quickly around the table. Who you got winning the pub and the Catholic League this year? I'm going to start with you. Uh, you can't pick Roman. I can't pick Roman. Would you pick Roman? I I wouldn't pick us right now. Just <laughs> just being in the gym, I wouldn't pick us. Okay, who you got winning the cap? Uh, if it's not, I would put money on. Right. Newman is coming back real strong this year. Uh, we going they're gonna be a, a, a force to contend with. Um, in the pub, it really don't matter. But the Catholic League. <laughs> I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Uh, Howard, who you got? Newman Emotep. Newman Emotep. You don't see no. I mean, Emotep's been dominant for a long time. You see anybody challenging them, pushing them, making it a contest? Or you think they're going to just roll over everybody again? Uh, school of the future, MCS. I think there's a lot of schools that's going to push them. Um, but I think that. Uh, and, you know, just seeing them in the off season, they still have a lot of guys that can play. They really do, and, so, and some size, yes, and some athleticism. Come I on. think that uh, so it's a lot of underrated teams in the pub, and there's more parity that's been in a while um, with respect to the big class that Emelta had leaving and transitioning to college. Um, but I, but I, but I pick Emotech just off of just just experience. Um, they've been here before a gazillion times, um, and they have uh, some senior leadership. Um, with influx them with some young guys in the Catholic League, I think Newman is uh, is thirsty. I think they're hungry. They kind of missed out the last couple of years, and I think you know I think Newman will win the Catholic League. I pick I pick Newman as my number one team in the area. Um, if if Taquan Woodley can pay attention and get his act together, I think he adds something to that Camden team that will make them really really a force to be reckoned with and shooting for that top spot. Um, I think a team that nobody really talks about that deserves a lot of attention, and they're doing it right now is Archbishop Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Ryan Archbishop Ryan is well coached. 
They got two Division One players. They've been there before. They were at the Final Four, what, two, three years two ago? Two years ago, two years yeah. ago. I, I mean, we don't talk about them. Of course, Wood, you know, of course. Nah, not of course, Roman, not of course. Roman. Hey, Hill Lights. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but, Kamal, before we go real quick, man, give a quick shout-out to your Philly Pride pros, man. There are a couple pros oh. that come out of Philly Pride camp, you know, that deserve some mention. Absolutely. So, uh, as of late, uh, as of late, I, I see uh, uh, DeAndre Hunter. Shout-out DeAndre Hunter uh, and, and the Hunter family, uh, Aaron and Sean Colson, um, Miss Priscilla. Uh, and Charles and Charlie Charles Brown from uh, St. George University. Shout out to Mr. Brown. And um, yo, those guys kind of came up through the program and, and they kind of listened and they kind of bought into overall what we was pushing. And and now you've kind of reached their dreams and and yeah. that's what it's all about. Right on. All right. Well, that concludes the initial inaugural episode. Wilson and Woods. We will be back next week. I look forward to it. We're going to delve into some of the really pressing issues facing us in this, this sports landscape. I think these kids getting that money off the court in college is a big one. We're going to try to do something on that. And until we see you again, that's a good evening. Talk to you. Sports talk, we going to chop it up. We all in watch. On the television, give opinions with a loss. Whether it's touchdown or three points. Of-